What does that mean, nature and cause? You see, how are you liable for this debt? Is it a debt to society? So it's a charge, you're being charged with something. It's all about money, okay? Is this a criminal charge? You have the right to demand to know how you became liable for the alleged debt to society or to face the charges, i.e. money, it's owed. It's all about money. See, US CFR 7211, all crimes are commercial. Unless they can show points and authorities which are statute law, case law, which are judgments in court decisions, any contract you have violated, etc. You are not liable, and their charges are false and fraud and an attempt to at extortion. If three or more are in collusion, the legal definition of which is to deny your rights, the charges would be racketeering to try and extort a fraudulent claim against you. Well, extortion would be to try to get money from you. You know, fraudulent claim. So, the next level of response, which can occur later than three days, because if you're going to use refused for cause, you should do it within 72 hours of getting any contract that you don't agree with. So, you don't agree with the traffic ticket, or you don't agree with the bank's assertions that you owe them money, or the credit card statement. You know, you basically have three days to rebut it. Under UCC, the average response, uh, you have 10 days to rebut. But the minimum amount of time you have to rebut is three days. If you are going to ask them to produce records and documents, then the minimum amount of time that they need is 21 calendar days. A safe amount of time to give them, if you have plenty of time, is 30 days. So if you used, uh, refused for cause, you should do it within three days. You can always send another letter in addition to the refused for cause. And you just refuse for cause, put it in an envelope, make a photocopy of it that you have a record, and put on the back of it that, uh, that you received the presentment on such and such a date, and now you're returning it. So the next level up would be a conditional acceptance. The conditional acceptance is staying in honor by accepting the claim conditioned upon proving the claim. I include an example later in this document. You will give a time period to rebut and prove or show cause why the claim is valid. I mean, otherwise, if they don't show cause, if they don't provide any evidence, what is it? It's an opinion. I mean, I can send anybody a letter and say you owe me $2,000. What's it worth? It's worth nothing because I'm not submitting any proof to justify my claim. Does the credit card company send you any proof or do they just say you owe me money? Well, saying you owe me money is nice, but it's still just your opinion until you actually show evidence. So that's what you're asking for is evidence to be shown. Failure to prove the claim will, will be evidence of it being fraudulent and having no basis in fact. The next level of serious authority on your part to send in a, a counterclaim or a rebuttal to another's claim against you would be to make an affidavit and self-executing contract. In this level of response, you will get an affidavit notarized as an affidavit is more powerful than a declaration or statement. In other words, if you just send a letter without saying, I, you know, sworn under penalty of perjury, and if you get it notarized, then that becomes an affidavit, and a notarized affidavit is your sworn testimony put into the public record. You could take a statement, get it notarized, and take it down to the county recorder's office and enter it into the county recorder's office, and then it would be in the public record. If you, went, if you had a court case open, or even a closed court case, you could go down to the closed court case and enter your affidavit in as evidence and get it file stamped and now it would be in the public record. Well, a notary's journal is the public record also and so when you have something notarized, it's entered into a journal that is a public record. This is important because only evidence that's entered into the public record can be entered into a court case. So, if, in case you haven't noticed, I kind of 
think a lot about court cases. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a lot of better things you can do with your life than do that, but anyway. So the affidavit is a sworn statement of your own experiences. You cannot include hearsay evidence. What's hearsay, i.e., Bob told me the caseworker said, you say, did you hear the caseworker say anything? No, you only have Bob's word that the caseworker said something. So you can't testify to what the caseworker said. Bob could testify to what the caseworker said. If Bob was willing to sign an affidavit that the caseworker said, told me, then that would be the way to include that evidence. Because you did not hear the words the caseworker said, and it's only your experience that, and personal beliefs that can be put down on an affidavit, the affidavit will have to be answered and rebutted with a notarized sworn affidavit or the opposition, that's the other side's, rebuttal will not have as much authority as your sworn affidavit. In other words, if I'm willing to testify under penalty of perjury and the other side is not, they lose. Once the notary puts their seal on the instrument, it's in the public record as it is recorded in an agent of the Secretary of State's notary journal. The self-executing contract will be a performance contract establishing consequences for non-response to your affidavit. Examples are provided at the end of this document. Now let's look at whether the courts, police, and governments as we know it have any lawful authority over us and what jurisdiction or control is. One has to read and understand the United States Constitution and the California Constitution and have a basis of knowledge about the law of the land. First off, what is your status? I mean, if the King of France comes over here, does he have to obey the, the law of the land over here? I mean, he does. Has, he has to obey the common law. If he shoots somebody and kills them, he's going to have to stand trial for that. Are you a subject of a king? The subject of a government? The subject of a state? The subject of your neighbor? Answer each of the above questions to get an idea of what your knowledge about your status is in relation to the entities named. The pilgrims coming to America circa 1700 were subjects of the King of England. The king was sovereign. Sovereign means there's no higher power that exists, and the sovereign makes the law, as we shall soon see. And the law, as stated in the Supreme Court decisions below, is, quote, At the revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people. And they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects, with none to govern but themselves. And that's from Chisholm versus Georgia, uh, two doll 419 454 that's a Supreme Court decision in 1793 quote sovereignty itself is of course not subject to law for it is the author and source of law but in our system while sovereign powers are delegated to the agencies of government sovereignty itself remains with the people by whom and for whom all government exists and acts. Quote, Yukwo versus Hopkins in 118 U.S. 356, that was a Supreme Court decision in 1886. Quote, the people of this state are the successors of its former sovereign, that would be King George, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. Quote, Lansing versus Smith, 4 Wind, 9, New York, 1829. And, quote, It is the public policy of this state that public agencies exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. California Government Code, Section 11120, that's the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, and, quote, the very meaning of sovereignty is that the decree of the sovereign makes law. Quote, American Banana Company versus United Fruit Company, 213 U.S. 347, another Supreme Court decision.